Okay, um, I'm very delighted to join you for History Week in uh, Clare County Library. Um, and as you can see from the slide, there are so many brilliant talks coming up. But today I want to talk to you about Republican surveillance of women during the War of Independence, a case studied of gendered violence from County Clare. Uh, and this was a, a type of violence that was committed against women all over the country. And I will discuss what was happening in Clare in the context of uh, what was happening in Ireland generally during the War of Independence. And on July the 9th, uh, 1921, a dispatch from the officer commanding of the West Clare Brigade of the IRA sent to the Director of Intelligence, IRA GHQ in Dublin, uh, a note discussing the case of Bridie Burke. According to the OC, Ms. Ms. Burke came home to kill Russian holidays and I got her detained. I intend keeping her under arrest until I hear from you. Let me have a reply by return. GHQ had been aware of who Bridie Burke was, so it, they didn't need any ex, uh, explanation, as communiques about her had been going back and forth from Clare to Dublin from late 1920. On the 18th of January 1921, the West Care Brigade wrote that they were looking into the case of Miss Burke, as requested by GHQ. And again on the 8th of February, Intel at GHQ wrote back saying, it is essential that you send us at once a full report of any circumstances relating to her, to her family, connections locally, etc. Between January and July 1921, while Burke was detained by the West Clare Brigade, there is much correspondence about her in the Collins papers held in the uh, military archives. Uh, and these papers have been digitized online so you can go and look at them as well. She and her family were subject to intense surveillance and intelligence gathering during these months. By April, the surveillance had uncovered that a Mr. Kelly, who was free, a frequent visitor to the Burke home, was a black and tan man, according to the notes. The brother of this black and tan, was, according to the reports, a Captain Kelly, who was an enemy intelligence officer in Cork and one of the torturers of Tom Hales, the, uh, of the famous Hales brothers, who were members of the IRA there. The commander of the Cork Third Brigade IRA, Hales, Sean Hales, had been, uh, or Tom Hales, excuse me, had been arrested, abandoned by the British Crown Forces. He'd been interrogated and tortured so badly that his mouth and hands were severely damaged. Captain Kelly and his intelligence, intelligence colleagues at Victoria Barracks in Cork were held responsible for torturing several IRA prisoners and numerous abortive attempts had been made on Kelly's life. Now the West Clare Brigade had in their sights a young woman associated with Kelly and his brother. As a result of this intense surveillance, a two page report on Bridie Burke was enclosed in the dispatch sent to GHQ in April 1921. She was described as the second daughter of James Burke and his wife, Margaret. James, her father, had, it noted, the, the report noted, during the time of the land agitation, played the game with the landlord and feathered his own nest behind the backs of his neighbours, who he pretended to lead and support. Margaret, his wife, was a member of the local family, noted for their loyalty to the Crown. So what they're doing here is building a case both against Bridie and her family. While Bridie's sister, Janie, was always intimate with members of the RIC on very friendly terms with an inter entertained Lieutenant K, Captain Kelly's brother, during a visit to Kirush. Other members of the extended family were noted as friendly with the RIC, although one brother, Pat, a Christian brother, was, it said, a good Irish man, hard to criticise his family and relatives. Bridie Burke herself, it seems, was a private typist employed in Victoria Barracks by Captain Kelly, where the first Southern Division of the IRA were also watching her. A communique from them on the 27th of July 1921 states that Bridie Burke has been taken into custody in West Clare. She has, they noted, the devil's own fine story and any amount of wonderful ways uh, of, of explaining a possible connection with pa Captain Kelly. While in custody, Burke did write a long and very complicated narrative how she came to be associated with the Kelly family, or at all times attempting to portray herself as the innocent party. Her letter attempt to position her actions as those of a, a kind of an innocent abroad. She attended, she wrote, uh, Cole Turns Academy in Cork, qualified as a typist in June 1920, and sent her application to the military barracks in Cork for work. As at the time, I did not much mind where I made a start. And of course, you have to remember, this is during the uh, height of the War of Independence. So obviously, she was either really naive, 
um, or she actually didn't mind where she got work, including work with the Crown Forces. Her explanation for her acquaintance with Kelly was a complicated narrative of association through his brother, a medical student in Cork who knew a nurse who knew Mrs. Kelly, their mother, who was from Kelly Dysart, Kill Dysart rather. The brother couldn't visit her, his mother, so asked Bridget, Bridget or Bridie to visit Mrs. Kelly. On arrival in Kildyser, she said, we were almost thrown out of the town. We did not know why until we made inquiries. Mrs. Kelly was not there, but a letter sent to Constable Kelly invited him to call on the Burks whenever he was around. And as reported by Bridie, whenever he came, he was in uniform with a trench coat. This, she wrote, was the only connection between Mrs. Kelly and my people, the, the Burke family. But Mrs. Kelly was not the issue here. It was her son, Constable Kelly, uh, and no one was taking Bridie's explanation at face value. As a report from the Clare um, Brigade to the IC of the 1st uh, um, Battalion Southern Division noted, she had the devil's fine old story. Bridie Burke was lucky that her detention by the West Clare Brigade came, uh, coincided with the beginning of the truce and with a guarantee from her that she would not return to work with Captain Kelly. And in the spirit of the present truce, she was released. On the 25th of July, 1921, a note from Dublin Intel to West Clare agreed to her release and further stated that she be told, with regards to her behavior in association with Captain Kelly, she may thank God she is not a man. And of course, had she been a man, it is likely she would have been taken out and shot as a spy. This surveillance of Bridie Burke, which extended over eight or nine months and was undertaken by people in or associated with several brigades of the IRA, Common Amman, and the Southern Division Command, was not unusual. Her association with Captain Kelly and her work in Victoria Barracks made her suspect. She was not the only one that Republican intelligence gatherers kept long-term watch on and about whom they sent detail notes to GHQ in Dublin. There were many men and women in the Collins papers on whom there was a detail surveillance. The women were watched, were deemed suspect, insufficient in their loyalty to the Republican cause, and indeed regarded as potential traitors to their fellow countrymen and women, similarly to the men. But also for the women, there were moral judgments made on them which you don't see about the men, not least because many of them were young, traveling around the country and meeting men without guardians present. Respectable Irish women, particularly respectable Republican women, did not behave in this manner. And if they did, judgment and punishment was demanded and was imposed. However, despite the killing of at least three women suspected of spying for the Crown forces, the IRA generally did not kill women suspects. General order number 13, issued in 1920 on women spies, issued by the HQ, ordered that even when guilty, women were not to be executed, as the consideration of her sex prevents the infliction of the statutory punishment of death. The majority of suspect women therefore were not killed, unlike the number of males, 186, spies and informers killed, according to Unino Halpine's research between January 1919 and December 1920. However, other punishments were devised to keep women and girls compliant, respectable, and behaving as proper Irish women, proper Irish Republican women. The military side of the guerrilla war, that of ambushes, assassinations, and attacks on RIC and military targets is important, and we read lots about that. But so too was the collaboration and compliance, active or forced, of the population. Collaboration by women, organized, i.e. in common amon, and unorganized, was recognized as central to the successful functioning of a guerrilla army. However, the IRA felt it also had to deal with any defiance or resistance from the civilian population, especially those it considered potential spies and, informer, uh, and informers who would be suspect in their loyalties. Surveillance and intelligence gathering was vital, much of it undertaken by common man, so it was oftentimes women spying on women. Large-scale surveillance of the population was undertaken by the IRA and Republican sympathizers, and violence was often the consequence of that uh, surveillance. As Brian Hughes notes, between January 1919 and December 1921, the IRA killed at least 277 civilians, the ma majority of them killed as spies and or informers. But non-lethal vi violence and coercion was more widespread, and although it is difficult to map precisely, as Hughes further remarks, 
These everyday har acts of harm and threat did not op operate in isolation to the less common ambushes and executions, but combined to dictate the atmosphere of violence and fear in the individual community. And I want to look at that in the context of very much gendered punishments that were happening. So the type of fear and terror in, in, inculcated in the women members of those communities. One of the most successful non-military campaigns of the war, of course, was the boycott of the policing arms of the British states, the RIC and the DMP. A boycott had been mooted as early as 1917, and once the War of Independence broke out, it intensified around the country. RIC men, their families and dependents, and anyone who interacted or worked with them were to be boycotted. The boycott extended to the British military stationed in RIC barracks, the Black and Downs and Auxiliaries, uh, and was imposed by both soft and coercive means. There was widespread compliance and support, although it did vary from area to area throughout the country, while those who resisted were noted and often encouraged by threatening letter or late night visit to fall in line with the boycott. This intimidation extended to women suspected to being friendly with the RIC or military and to barrack servants who worked for the RIC who faced intimidation and ostracization. As Hughes has written, an official order from IRA headquarters was not produced until the 4th of June 1920 and offered little in the way of practical instruction. So it remained uh, down to individual IRA companies to obey the boycott and ensure uh, um, others did likewise by whatever means they deemed necessary. And I want to look at the means they used, particularly on barrack servants now. In June 1920, in the Michael Collins papers, there is a request from the Dingle County Kerry Company of the IRA to GHQ about what they should do with RIC barrack servants. What they asked were they to do with the one or two women who cook and wash for them? Are they to, made, made, are they to be made to give up their job? And the reply was a terse yes. They didn't explain how they were to do it, but they were to do it. These barrack servants' jobs were mainly held by older, poor married women to avoid the potential for scandal by having unmarried women uh, working in an all-male environment. As Brian Griffith notes, re regulations had stipulated that servants be either old women or married women. Many were widows or poor working class women. This was often their family's only income, a low paid but steady and secure income. So coercion and intimidation was used to encourage those resisting the boycott to leave their job. This encouragement included surveillance of their activities, sending verbal warnings or threatening letters, attacking them or members of their family, shooting up their homes, or forcibly cutting off their hair. There are many examples from around the country, and in Clare we have several. As early as November 1919, shots were fired at the home of a Mrs. Clune in Kilrush. She was a barrack servant and also had been seen speaking to a policeman. The following month, in December 1919, a Mrs. Mary Scanlon, a barrack servant in Kildysert, was threatened. On the 22nd of December, the Freeman's Journal reported her house was forcibly entered by a party of disguised men who threatened violence if she did not give up her job. In May 1920, a barrack servant in Broadford was threatened and shots was fire were fired into her home. An interesting court case shows the complications and ramifications of dealing with barrack servants. A maternity nurse, Margaret Kelly in Kildysert, had been sued by a Mr. and Mrs. Fitzgerald for breach of contract. Kelly had not honored her contract to look after Mrs. Fitzgerald while Mrs. Fitzgerald was pregnant because the Fitzgeralds had received threatening letters that if Kelly worked for them, he's, Mrs. Fitzgerald would be shot. This is because Nurse Kelly had earlier attended the Kildysert barrack servant who had been brutally assaulted and terribly injured in order to encourage her to give up her job in the local RIC barracks. Ever since then, Kelly herself had been rigorously boycotted and every one of her patients had received threatening letters and four houses had been fired into where she was engaged. So Nurse Kelly, who wasn't actually working directly for the RIC, but had attended a barrack servant who had been um, brutally attacked was now being boycotted herself. This shows the degree with which any engagement with the RIC and its personnel, right down to the lowly barrack servant, was deemed suitable for extreme and sometimes violence, violent pun punishment. This is just a few of the very many attacks on barrack servants that happened in Clare and all over the country. 
most of um, these did have the desired effect with the women leaving their place of employment, often placing themselves and their families in deeper poverty and want. While the intimidation of women out of jobs in the RIC barracks is not usually considered in the histories of the revolution, uh, particularly of what David Fitzpatrick termed a systemic national crusade against the police, it is important to note that this was a specific and gendered targeting of women workers. Without these domestic servants working for them, the surveillance um, and intimidation of the barrack ser servants having had the desired effect, the work of the RIC was now much more, much harder. Along with the refusal to engage with or supply the barracks, the fact that the general domestic work in the barracks, the cooking and cleaning, had now to be in, undertaken by the policemen themselves impacted on their ability to function effectively in the community. So again, it was the RIC boycott having effect. Not only were barrack servants under constant surveillance and threat by Republicans, however, so too were women, particularly younger women, who were deemed to have suspect association with police and military. For the rest of this paper, I want to spend some time uh, on this, in which we can un unpack the type of surveillance and threat which women and teenage girls received from Republicans in 1920 and 21, and its impact and legacies on Irish women's position in society. Looking particularly at Claire, uh, I, I want to, to unpack that. In February 1921, a note was sent uh, from the Tipperary 3rd Brigade IRA to the Director of Intelligence in Dublin uh, with a request for advice. What, it inquired, would you please advise to have done with girls, some of them having brothers in the IRA, keeping company with black and tans? And of course, company keeping or keeping company means they were seen chatting with them, they might be going out on dates with them, going for walks with them, or indeed be engaged. Uh, there was actually a, an established relationship between uh, RIC, Black and Tan, or, and some of the girls in the local area. It said, we have several cases of this kind around the area. I'd like the advice on the matter before we take action. The reply came on March 5th, 1921. I suggest the remedy is the brother should give notice immediately when the girls went out and that consequently a, a suitable opportunity be found for dealing with the Black and Tans themselves. They also dealt with the women. The directive here is the brothers keep watch on and by implication control of their sisters and their suspected associations with Crown forces and opportunities be uh, taken to deal with the men they were supposedly meeting. We know from multiple sources that it was not only the brothers, however, watching their sisters, but young women were also under surveillance for many members of their communities, and reports on their behaviour was delivered to local Republicans, to common Amman branches, to Sinn Féin branches, and to IRA units. For women, however, the charge of company keeping with the Crown forces appears again and again. As the historian of the Black and Tans, D.M. Leeson, has written, Women who kept company with police were liable to suffer threats or violence or both. Company keeping could be anything from seeing talking to a policeman or soldiers, to actually walking out with these men, to being in a relationship, etc. In intelligence reports and newspaper reports, RIC reports, these women, on these women, it's just not uh, the reporting of suspect behaviour or the incidences, but again you hear a moral judgment being passed on these for their company keeping. This disreputable lifestyle was as important as the information they potentially might have been sharing. The offences the majority of the women under surveillance in the Collins papers, for example, were accused of was forming personal relationships with Crown forces and of being suspect during these encounters of passing information. How Republican dealt with these uh, reports varied. Many women and girls received verbal warning and threats, more received threatening letters. In April 1920, several girls in Milltown, Malbay, County Clare were warned repeatedly to stay away from the military. Two of them were then sanctioned by having their hair bobbed. They use the term bobbed, that means forcible hair cutting. They were attacked by a group of men, they're held down, their hair was sheared off and not in a gentle fashion. The newspaper reported that they are now wearing wigs. In December 1920, 12 armed and masked men broke into the house of Minnie Keane in Kilrush and informed her and her friend Annie O'Shea that their hair was to be cut and they were lucky that they were not going to be shot for being friendly with the police. In the previous month, November 1920, there is a report in the Cork Examiner of an unnamed girl who was marched through the village of Quilty for the crime of being friendly with the police. 
Their same report mentions that four girls were attacked at a dance in Quilty and may have had their hair cropped for the crime of company keeping. In March 1920, as I said, two uh, girls were, were hair cropped in Milltown Malbay. Indeed, one of the earliest incidences of hair cropping in the entire War of Independence in the country comes from County Clare, when in December 1919, Nora Williams in Listo and Varna was pulled out of her bed and had her hair cropped off for company keeping. And, and this is a very prosaic um, um, reporting of what is actually a very violent incident. Uh, usually you had more than five armed and masked men attacking a house late at night. Obviously, Nora Williams was in bed at that time, so she would have been in her night attire. The young girl would be isolated within the house or taken outside and isolated outside the house, surrounded by these men, um, held down uh, and have their hair cropped off. Um, the um, Lil Conlon, for example, talks about women being attacked and having their hair cut and suffering other insults and indignities. So what else is happening during these attacks, we have to ask. Because the word sexual assault or sexual abuse uh, aren't used, we the word generally used is outrage. So what outrages are being committed on these women, as well as having their hair cropped off? Tomas uh, McConmara in his book, The Time of the Tans in County Clare, details the suffering of the civilian population during the War of Independence, including the awful sufferings of women. While much of what he details was the violence suffered by women during raids and reprisals by the Crown forces, and these, uh, although I'm concentrating here on Republican violence, Crown forces were also committing violence against women. There were many of these uh, incidences in Crown force reprisals. He also notes that the IRA was equally capable of brutally punishing female uh, informers. An incident in Lehinch demonstrates this vividly, where a woman suspected of informing was attacked beaten up and pig rings clammed into her bucket, buttocks forcibly. She was then told, go to the RIC now and take the, out that. The interviewee who, to, who told McConmara uh, the story also managed, mentioned the usual punishment when women were tarred and feathered, if they had anything to do with the black and tans or the RIC, if you ever spoke to them, if you ever gave them a cup of tea, any involvement would do at times. In a lot of cases, they made off that if you gave them a cup of tea, you would be giving them information as well. So they, the IRA, took no chances. So here we have tarring and feathering, a hair cropping, uh, forcibly putting uh, pig rings into the buttocks of a woman. Uh, and these are extremely violent attacks. And while this paper concentrates on the surveillance of, and Republican violence, I also want to note that there was violence, sometimes extreme violence, committed on women by the Crown, Crown forces, ranging from home invasions or raids, physical assaults, sexual assault and rape, and many instances of forcible hair cropping. One of the most well known of these uh, forcible hair cropping occurrences in Clare was the attack uh, and hair cropping of the well-known Common Amon uh, activist Anne Babe Hogan, who in October 1920 was attacked in her home by armed and masked men and her hair was brutally cropped off. She managed to pull the mask off one of the men and recognised him as an RIC member. Hogan was very active in Clare for Common Amon and so no doubt she was deliberately targeted. And she wasn't the only active women targeted by the Crown forces. In March 1920, a Catherine Fennessy in Six Mile Bridge was attacked in her home by men raiding for arms and her hair was cut to the bone. During a raid uh, at the home in Knock County Clare in September, a Constable Huddleston of the RIC, Black and Tans, was accused of attempted indecent assault on two women, including the homeowner, and this was reported in the Irish Bulletin of December 1920. These are just a few examples of the violence committed by the Crown forces on the women in Clare. Going back to, however, to the Republican uh, intelligence and surveillance and coercive control of women, hair, body, hair bobbing, shaving, cropping, forcible hair coupling, these were the contemporary terms used for forcible hair cutting, often accompanied by extre sometimes extreme violence that girls and women experienced during the War of Independence, mainly from the spring of 1920 to the summer of 1921, with smaller spikes uh, occurring in the spring and summer of 1922. And interestingly, there's also an incident of um, a family, a woman and her daughters being hair cropped during the Civil War in Clare. Uh, they were anti-treaty IRA, so they were attacked by the National Army. 
So far, my research has uncovered from multiple sources over 230 individual incidences of forcible hair cropping between late 1919 uh, and early 1922 in Ireland, the majority of them by Republicans. There is no doubt, however, that forcible hair cutting was used as a major weapon of coercive control by Republicans who wished to prevent their women from forming per personal relationships with Crown forces and additionally, it is not, as many have presumed, it was not a hidden aspect of violence during, against women during this time. Dozens of cases or outrages, as they were commonly termed, were reported in newspapers, both national and local, as well as in British newspapers, American newspapers, Australian newspapers. One of the most widely reported cases was that of, of Bridget Keegan in nearby uh, or in the neighboring county of County Galway in Tune. Who was attacked, assaulted, and had her hair cropped by armed and masked men late on the night of April 30, 1920. As many newspapers reported, the men took her out of the house while clad only in her nightdress, cut off her shears, cut off her hair with the shears, uh, and told her that's what she got for going with Tommies, Tommies being the uh, colloquial term for British soldiers. Four local men were subsequently arrested, tried, and found guilty of this outrage. The Keegan outrage and the subsequent trial was reported in almost every local and national newspaper, as well as newspapers like the Manchester Guardian uh, and what were reported indeed around the world. The attack on Babe Hogan in County Clare was also widely reported. Many of the incidences of hair, of hair cropping that I found in Clare and elsewhere are actually from newspaper reports, local and national. In 1920 and 1921, so forcible hair cropping of young women for company keeping, as well as other interactions of, with the police were regular occurrences and well known in the local communities. It was open and common knowledge that these were the punishments that would be inflicted on women who were considered disloyal, disloyal or engaged in behaviours not fitting for respectable Irish women. In Tralee in County Kerry in 1920, for instance, a poster was put up on Ash Street to warn girls under severe penalty from associating with police. Public notices appeared in Cork, appeared in Galway and appeared in various towns throughout the country, where many of them stated that any girls speaking to police from this, for this forward are liable for the penalty of a haircut and not a nice haircut at that. The warnings in these posters were often carried out. Many young women seen to be company keeping or suspected of same were subject to these controls. Sometimes they would receive a warning, verbal or written, a threatening letter, or they would be physically assaulted. If they continued to um, be, or, or su were suspected of continuing to be uh, company keeping, they then would have their hair forcibly cut off. For instance, in the uh, Kerry men reported that two sisters, Margaret and Julia McCarthy in County Kerry, had their hair shorn for company keeping after getting several letters. Um, Annie O'Leary in Ocastle West um, in August 1920 had her hair cropped for being friend friendly with the police, having gotten um, her, her threatening letters before that. While most of the hair cropping attacks uh, happened in Munster in the counties of Limerick, Cork and Kerry, as well as in Clare and Galway, that there is no county in which a few did not occur. So why is why why was this um, type of violence against women considered to be so effective? As academic Louise Ryan has written, women were defined through their relationship with the enemy, as spies or as girlfriends, and these relationship made these women as shameful, as deviant, as immoral, as lacking in the most necessary of markers of Irish proper Irish femininity, respectability. The, this possessive and coercive attitude towards women is reflected in several statements by men uh, who later gave those statements to the Bureau of Military History. As one James Maloney of the Bruff uh, volunteers later noted, Bruff and County Limerick, some young girls created a problem. The British uniform was attraction to them, as indeed any uniform uh, would be. They could be a real danger to the movement and gave a bad example by consorting with the enemy. They were warned repeatedly and stronger measures had to be resorted to. No volunteer liked the job, but on these occasions, the girl's hair was cut. And if you see that image that I'm using, that is a still from a short British Pathé uh, 1920 uh, newsreel that is of a young woman who had been hair cropped. And you can see how 
how awful the hair cropping is. There are parts of her, her scalp is showing uh, in Limerick in 1920. Um, here we have to here we have what we understand in contemporary terms as victim blaming. The girls were attracted to the uniform. The men had to make sure they behaved themselves. The women and girls were considered the problem. They were the per perpetrators of misdeeds, which had to be punished so that proper Republican order could be restored. Women and girls who consorted with the enemy were seen as those who were attacked and cropped as tendus, that is the sh shorn women in France in 1945 and six, France and Belgium and other parts um, as the Western forces um, freed those areas that had been under control of the Nazis. Um, the Tondus were considered not only morally loose, but traitorous, and as potential informants, a threat to the existence of the nation. Along with the potential that the women might be in forward, uh, informers, there was also the strong suspicion that their behaviour revealed uncontrolled, deviant female sexuality, impure behaviours, which concerned men who carried out these attacks. As T.K. Wilson wrote, the issue of hair cutting might be seen as sexualized punishment in that it had deliberately targeted the femininity of women who were held to have betrayed their national responsibilities. Republican men, such as Leo Buckley, undertook the hard but necessary work, as they saw it, of punishing and publicly shaming these deviant, immoral women. This work was seen as essential to reinforcing the conservative values, morals, and ideals of the respectable Irish woman, values that would come to dominate the discourse of women's place in the upcoming, soon to be um, in place Irish free state. Surveillance of women and their punishments and behaviors such as forcible hair cropping by Republicans was a way of reinforcing their position as protectors of the future and of imposing control over the behavior of their women and fortifying the purity of the imagined nation for which they were fighting. With the guilty woman or girl shamed and often named in the newspaper, and that's why we have so many names, uh, their names are actually in the newspaper, so that compounds the, same, the shame. Her sins are obviously, uh, are obvious, obvious uh, from her shorn head. Uh, as Leo Buckley of the Cork Number no. One Brigade later said, the appearance of a girl with bobbed hair clearly donated, denoted sorry, her way of life. Um, her repentance and ostracization was assured. Republican men could then uphold and defend the community they came to protect, reinforce their own hegemonic masculinity, authority and leadership in whatever new state came into being. Furthermore, as Maria Luddy has written, the state had achieved post-revolution, the state that was achieved post-revolution, the Irish Free State, was one where women could continue to be seen as central to understanding how immorality could harm society and a state where the coercive control of women's behaviours, femininities and bodies would be central to the discourse of respectability, of moral and pure Irish Catholic womanhood and of one where women and girls would be surveilled, shamed and stigmatised for decades more. Thank you very much.